we're joined by, um, you know, uh, my good friend Miji will tell you, my role model, someone who, as I grew up in politics and uh, just has admired my whole life. And about a year and a half ago, I said, I got to get Mr. Brown to come to my inaugural diversity summit because he embodies everything that MMSA is all about, his spirit, his life, his legacy. I think, you know, we hear about hidden figures. Um, I can't think of a more incredible giant. And to my good fortune, I'm always watching more than Joe, and there's this brother who's killing it. The smartest can be, Ivy League like me, good looking, graying, and just, oh, just yeah. amazing. And now we have them both here. And so let me just go ahead and introduce um, this incredible um, fireside chat we're about to have. And um, so uh, we, we know that uh, Mr. Brown, who's the founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of BNC Associates, Inc. And I'll let um, Mr. Glaude sort of talk a little bit more his bio because I think it has come up. But I do want to just quickly just go through Dr. Glaude's bio. Um, who is the chair of the Department of African American Studies for Princeton University. Uh, Dr. Glaude Jr. is a scholar who speaks to the black and blue in America. His most well-known books, Democracy and Black, How Race Still Enslaves the American Soul, and In a Shade of Blue, Plagiarism and the Politics of Black America take a wide look at black communities and reveal complexities, vulnerabilities, and opportunities for hope. He is chair of Princeton Department of African American Studies, as I said, and is the current president of the Af American Academy of Religion. Currently, Dr. Claude is at work on a book about James Baldwin, tentatively titled James Baldwin, America's 1963 to 1972. He is a columnist for Time Magazine and regularly provides commentary on radio and television news programs like Democracy Now! Morning Joe in the 11th hour. He hosts the podcast AAS21 recorded at Princeton University in Stanhope Hall in, in the African American Studies Department's home. We got to say that because I just want you to know how incredible this brother is. Thank you so much. Thank you. Turn it over. Appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. Um, I am so honored uh, to have the opportunity to just sit down and have a conversation with you, Mr. Brown. Great to be here. Um, there's so much about our journey to now that goes beyond the people we know, but the people who in some ways laid the path for us to be where we are. And you're one of those heroes, one of those persons. So I want to begin by having you talk a bit about the foundation of your formation. And that's Miss Nellie Brown. Talk a bit, because you're from High Point, North Carolina. Um, that house, uh, all of those, the, the garden you had, the chicken coop, the potatoes, sweet potato on one side, white potatoes on the other, those mustard seeds that she used to buy too much of that you didn't think. Talk a little bit about Miss Brown and how important she is and was to your formation. Well, I was, uh, I grew up in High Point, North Carolina. Now, most people don't know where that is, but uh, it's the furniture capital of the world. Uh, we used to make more furniture there than any place else in the world. And my grandfather worked in the furniture factory. He worked at Tomlinson. And uh, he was a night watchman. He delivered everything. He was a janitor sometimes. And uh, he fired the boiler. And now, to show you how God works things, uh, that company has been out of business uh, for quite a long time. But they use that building as a furniture showroom. And I've been through every inch of that building uh, because I used to walk it with my grandfather. And now, in the middle of that building, they have a, a club there called the String and Splinter Club. It's a club, it's a private club for, for most of the big furniture manufacturers, executives who come in and 
and uh, a lot of the executives in the, in, the, in the area. And I belong to that club. I belong to it for many, many years. Uh, but every time I go in that place, I, I mean, if I go there five days a week for lunch or for dinner, I think about those years growing up when I would go through every inch of that building with my grandfather who was working there as, a, as the fire the boiler and as the night watchman. And I would take my books up there around the boiler room where it was big fire and it was plain light. And I would study my books until we got ready to go home. And then I'd walk on home with my grandfather. But it, life is just absolutely incredible. I mean, I've had so many opportunities presented to me all over the world. I've gone to different places. Uh, I've had homes in different places in Africa. I've been all over Africa. I've worked with uh, the heads of state of many of the African countries. I work with the African Union, where all of them have gotten together at various times. Um, I've worked with different mega corporations, some of the biggest companies in the world. I've served on the board of some of the biggest companies in the world, like Duke Energy. Duke Energy is the largest company of its kind in the world. Uh, I've served on Walkover Bank's board. I've served on First Union Bank's board. Uh, I served on Sunoco Products Board for many years until I retired from it about four or five years ago. It's one of the, if not the largest packaging company in the world. And not only did I serve on the board of all these companies, but I also served as a consultant. You know, I had two, three hats in every place I was. <laughs> But I, I, the thing that encouraged me most and that I got, I think, the most out of was my time working with Martin Luther King Jr., uh, working with B. Elton Cox of CORE, working with Jim Farmer of CORE and, and Whitney Young and all that. We're going to get you. I want you to walk with Okay. That's important. Got to get you. This isn't all. No. It's getting better. It's better. Uh, Growing up in High Point, as I read your, your his searing autobiography, it's amazing. You have to read. There, there's something. There are these moments, Doc, where you're grappling with your anger and your rage, and it, it's it, it's it's a through line in the book that there are ways in which you experience the South, how it impacts and shapes you, there's a way in which your grandmother is shaping you that informs right. the tenacity that, that evidences itself in all the things you just described. So talk a little bit about what, what, how, what you had to negotiate and navigate as a man of the South, of high point. Well, I, as a kid, I was uh, once, I was about five years old. And my grandmother and I, she would take me downtown with her. And um, sometimes we couldn't walk on the sidewalk. The, the white people coming down there, we'd get off walking in the street. But on this particular day, we went in the back door of the, of the Woolworth store. And there were two water fountains there. Uh, one colored water fountain and one white water fountain. And it said white water and colored water. Well, I, I need to drink a water. It was in the summertime, it was hot. So I started drinking out of the white water fountain. And my grandmother looked around, she saw me drinking that water. She said, Bobby, uh, you can't drink out of that water. She said, I said, Mama, what's the difference between this water and that water? She said, there ain't no difference. It's all God's water, uh, and he's going to fix it one of these days. That's what she told me. I'm drinking. She, she didn't know that God was going to use me to help fix it. And uh, I went to jail fixing it. But we fixed it. Ha, <laughs> 
gotten this job as a policeman. It was my first job. I had just uh, finished my second year of college. And I, I did well in college. I made mostly A's and everything. And, uh, but my grandmother and grandfather were ill, both of them. And I just spent my second year at a and t And uh, I said, you know, I really need to go to work. I need to do something. And so I went up and I took the police examination. They were, I saw it in one of the newspapers, in an old newspaper I was reading. They said on that particular date they were going to have this test. So I went down there and asked the man, could I take the test? Because they only had about three or four blacks on the police force, and that was sort of their black thing with the police. And I said, I want to take the test. And he says, how old are you? I said, I just turned 21. He said, well, go on in there and take that test. So I went in and took the test. And uh, about a week or uh, so later, um, the police came to my house. I wasn't there. I was still finishing up my last few days of school at a and And they told my grandmother uh, to have me to call them when I got home. So that evening, I got home from, you know, from school, and my grandmother and my grandpa were very nervous because the police, you know, back then, the police come to your house. Boy, that's something else. I mean, somebody's going to jail, or they're going to kill somebody, beat somebody to death. And uh, so my grandmother said, you got to call the police. Said, Captain Johnson came by here. So she said, Bobby, you're not in any trouble, are you? I said, no, ma'am, Mom, I'm not in trouble. So we didn't have a telephone, so I went across the street, used a telephone, and called him. And he said, Robert, said I just want to talk to you. You're not in any trouble. He said, I'll come right down to your house. Well, we didn't live but about uh, 12 blocks from the police station. And a few minutes later, I mean, 15 minutes later, he's pulling up in front of my house. And he said to me, he came up on the porch, he said, Robert, he said, you're not in any trouble, and I want to tell you that to start with. He said, you took our examination, our po po policeman, the other week, and uh, we just wanted to see uh, if you wanted to become a policeman. We'd really like to have you to be a policeman. So you made the highest mark anybody's ever made on our test. So we need you on the police board. So, so I, was, I was just blown away. I mean, here I am. I mean, it, this was 1956. Okay, 56. Can you imagine what it was like in 56? You can't even imagine what it was like. Because everything was segregated. I mean, it was just bad news all the way around. So I told him I would call him back in a couple of days. And then I talked to my grandparents about it. My grandmother said, oh, Lord have mercy. You don't want to be no policeman. <laughs> she said... You know, that's going to be a terrible job for you, Bobby. And my grandfather kind of liked it because there were only a, you know, a few black police anywhere in, in the South in general and, put, and even in New York. And so I decided after a couple of days of thinking about it that I would take this job. So I took the job. And one thing happened after another. I took the job, and I, I did extremely well. Um, I started to help them recreate some of their manuals and stuff that they were talking about and all that kind of thing. And then uh, some federal agents came to, to town, and they were looking for uh, some narcotic dealers who had been spreading dope around. And the chief assigned me to work with them. You know, I guess because I was young, I was supposed to know everything. 
about that. So I worked with them, and one thing happened after another. Uh, we were very successful because I knew where who was selling the dope and where it was being sold and everything. So, and I never did, I never did like that. I don't like it today. I didn't like it then. So I wanted to stamp it out because I saw what it was doing to some of our uh, younger people. And so we were very successful in those efforts. And when we finished, uh, the agents told me, he said, hey, look, we need you in a job in Washington or New York with the Bureau. And uh, I said, well, uh, you don't have any black people in that kind of job, do you? They said, well, we've got, I think they had two. Two in the whole United States of America. So uh, he said, and I said, you know, I didn't graduate from college. I only had two years of college. And they said, well, we don't care anything about that because we're going to take this straight to the commissioners. You just fill out the papers that we sent. So they sent me some papers. I fill them out. A few days later, or a couple of weeks later, they are investigating me. And my grandmother finds out. She finds out because the FBI is going around asking questions about me. And so my grandmother calls the police department one day. And she told the uh, desk sergeant to have me to come by her house as soon as possible. I thought there was something wrong. So I went by there, and my grandmother said, Bobby, are you in any trouble, son? <laughs> I, said, I said, no, ma'am, mom, I'm not in any trouble. She, I said, why? She said, well, the FBI is investigating you all over town. See, everybody's talking about how the FBI is asking questions about you. And I said, and then I had to fess up. I told her what was happening. And she said, well, son, you know, uh, that's, that might be a very, very bad thing. Because there's some bad people up there in New York and Washington around, you know. But she didn't really know how bad it was because I was, I ended up working on the mafia. I've testified in the Vito Genovese case, which is the biggest mafia case in the history of the world. And several, and what made it even worse than that, uh, the judge, after I got to testifying, after a couple of days of testimony, two or three days, the judge asked me to get off the stand and go point to the guys that I had dealt with. Now, how am I going to do that? I'm with the worst mafia guys in the whole world, you know what I mean? So anyway, I did it, and I got through that, and all those guys were convicted and so forth. And I just felt that maybe there's an unwritten rule that you don't touch an agent. If you do, it's proxy on your house. You know, I'm talking about your children, your wife, everybody, sister, brother, everybody. So the mafia, you've never heard of the mafia touching an agent. And so uh, I just... I kind of depended on that, but I depended on my own skill. I cared for, for two or three years after I left the Bureau. I had an ankle gun. I had a gun around in my, on my leg. I had a gun in my pocket. And I wish I had that switchblade knife that I cared. I had one of them push-button stilettos, push button. I still have that knife, by the way. <laughs> now, let, me, let me ask you this. Now, this is Mr. Mm -hmm. Durant. We, we skipped a little from the moment. You saw it when you were young. I don't know how that happened. Teenage love, Miss Bell. Oh, Sally. Because this is the I, that's right. No, 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 no. No, you, 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 you're right on it. I see you did your homework too. <laughs> anyway, I had I had met this. My grandmother was a gospel singer in addition to everything else she did. So we would go around the churches. So one night I was maybe about six years old, five or six years old, and I went to this church with my grandmother. And this little girl was sitting in there, about the same age I was. And she was a year younger, and I. I started looking at her, and I couldn't stop looking at this girl. And so my grandmother sang a couple of songs, and she came back, sat down, and she had her head turned around looking at me, and I'm looking at her like this. And uh, so my grandmother said, Bobby, what you doing looking at that little old girl like that? I said, Mama, she's kind of pretty. 
So uh, anyway, that little girl became my wife. Uh, we were married for 47 years. We got married. I was 21, and she was 20. And uh, she traveled with me all over the world. She helped me start my business. When I left the Bureau in New York, uh, she didn't want to leave New York because we were having a great time. You know, we were visiting all the clubs, all of the, uh, the educational things because she was heavy into that. And we were just having a marvelous time. And I'm telling her that I had, think I have to go back to North Carolina to start a public relations business. And there were, I mean, that was something that black folk went into. I mean, they, she was trying to figure out, what on earth are you talking about, Robert? And so anyway, I, I, uh, I moved. I decided to move, and she decided to go with me. And if it had not been for her, I wouldn't be sitting here today because she was an absolutely magnificent person. She had my back all the time. Uh, the letters, I didn't have the money to, to uh, hire a secretary or anything, but she was an excellent typist. She was a brilliant woman. She would tell me the kind of letters I ought to write, and I would write them, and then she would correct them. In fact, I wrote a letter one time to a company called Commercial Credit Company. It was the biggest company. It was based in Baltimore. Some of you may have heard of that company. It, it's, it's, uh, it was a merge into another company several years ago. But I wrote this letter, and, and Sally corrected it, and I sent the letter out to the chairman of the board. You know, I always, when I sent out a letter, when I just, you know, I'm just, I had an office over an abandoned theater, right? With a desk and a chair and a typewriter in there and everything, and that's where I was working at. But I was writing letters to the chairman of the board of the biggest companies in America. And uh, everybody thought I was crazy. In fact, the guys on the street, they would see me and they were laughing. You know, they were laughing. But anyway, I wrote this letter and Sally corrected the letter and, and had it just where it's supposed to be. I got a call from that company about a few days later, and it was from the office of the executive vice president and chief uh, uh, officer, executive officer of the company. And that's where the company was set up. And the lady said he wanted to see me because they were thinking about hiring me. So when I went to Baltimore to meet with him uh, three or four days later, I'm sitting in this guy's office talking to him. I mean, he has one of the great big offices, wood paneling. He says, look, I want to tell you to begin with, the reason why you're here is because you wrote one of the best letters that I had ever written, that I had ever read. And not only that, you didn't have any error on the letter punctuation mark, everything. He said, that's one of the few kind of letters I had to be able to hear. Now, this was a top executive, a top company telling me this. He said, that's why you're here. And he said, we want to hire you. And uh, he outlined what problems they had. And I said, oh, I can take care of all that, of course, so, you know. Anyway, that company became a client, and they were a client for many, many years. But to take you one step further, when I went to the White House to work, uh, we were getting all kinds of programs together. And one of them was uh, dealing with inflation and high prices. So we needed a special uh, group to helm uh, all of this kind of thing within the White House. And the president asked me, we were sitting in a meeting, the president asked me, Bob, you've been working with these companies, you know and these guys that might be in there who might be interested. And I did. I knew uh, one fellow that, uh, from commercial credit company, this company that hired me several years before. And, and uh, I presented his name, and the White House hired him. And he became the top guy in America dealing with uh, all that kind of thing. So talk to us about Google. Go back. I go back. Right. 
well, to begin with, Woolworth uh, became a client. Uh, they were my first major client. They were having breakouts all over the country, north, south, east, and west. And I came up with a whole series of ideas that they ought to engage the black community. They didn't have anybody. I mean, they didn't even have a black secretary working in their executive office. A World War building in New York was the tallest building in New York. They didn't have a black secretary working in there. So I went and out and surveyed their situation a little bit. And then one day I went to their office. And uh, I, I asked the guy in the building there, I said, where is the chairman of board's office? Which one of these floors? It's cold visit. So he told me it's up on that floor 44, 36, something. And uh, so I got on the elevator and went up there. And when I got off the elevator, there was a, a secretary desk sitting right over there. And I got off the elevator, and this white lady stood up, looked at me. What you doing up here? What you want? I said, I want to see the chairman of the board. She said, uh, he's not in. I said, well, I want to see the vice president for public relations. It's very important. And I was disappointed about it. She said, well, I'll go around here. I'll get up, go around here and see if he can see you. So a few minutes later, she comes back with this guy. E.F. Harrigan was his name. And he was the vice president for public relations. And so he asked me, what can I do for you? I said, well, it's more about what I might be able to do for Woolworth. I said, you need some counseling. You need a lot of things. And he said, well, come on around to my office. He said, I'll give you about five or ten minutes. That's all I got. Two hours later, I'm still in the office talking to him, <laughs> telling him what they need to do. And they became a client for 36 years, I represented them. Not only them, but all the companies that they own. Not only that, but at somebody, we were talking about Ford and M a little while ago. Uh, Woolworth was one of the first major companies to go down to Florida A&M and sponsor uh, a whole bunch of things at the Orange Blossom Classic. I know because I took them down there, along with other companies. And that's how I became heavily involved with Jake Gaither and all. Jake became one of my closest friends because I set it up where these companies would be doing the same thing they were doing for over on the other side of town for the major white school. They weren't doing anything. They couldn't, they couldn't get anything produced because they were trying to put up a little money themselves. I said, oh, no, no, we ain't doing that no more. And then later on, I became a member of Florida a and board for a number of years. Uh, but, but Jake became one of my closest friends. And we changed the whole thing, everything. I had Woolworth coming in, sponsored lunches, dinners. I had A&P, one of my clients. I had Johnson Wack. I had everybody in there in Florida and in. I had everybody down there, man. People were coming from everywhere to get free stuff. Because, see, I bought, <laughs> I bought all that free stuff all in there, too. I mean, just cases of everything that companies would be making, and I had stuff made up. So it was a wonderful, wonderful relationship. Absolutely. Well, uh, Dr. King and I became close, close friends. I traveled with him, served on his board, his executive committee. Uh, you know, I went to jail and did the whole, whole nine yards. And, and Dr. King uh, uh, would tell me from time to time, you know, and I'd see it, that they don't have any money for this and don't have no money to have a national meeting, and don't have this, don't have that. So I said, okay, well, let me do this. So I got my clients, most of them, like Woolworth, Rambi, and all of them, to set up a special funds that I could totally control myself and do whatever the hell I wanted to do with it. So, of course, I, you know, I sponsored all kind of stuff for the movement. You know, ain't nobody going to question me. How are they going to question me? Shoot, to get out of my face. So <laughs> I went on and sponsored everything. You ask anybody who was at SCLC or 
a snake and, and the rest of them during that time. I was finding stuff for everybody. Yes, John Lewis. John, John and I go all the way back to those days. In fact, when John sees me now, if he would have come in his room, the first thing he would do is lift up his, you saw him do that. First thing he would do is lift up his leg to see the sock uh, because I printed socks to all of them. I had thousands of dozens of socks that I just make sure. Because one day Dr. King and I were traveling. We were in the airport together. And he had his leg up looking up, reading the Bible or something. And uh, I looked, and he had a big old hole in his sock, in the heel of his sock. I said, man, what the world are you doing? He said, well, Bob, we ain't got there no money to get those socks, man. He said, I ain't worried about no socks. I said, I'm worried about it. So what, what we did, what I did, we, were, we, we had the largest hosiery manufacturers in America in High Point. That was one thing we did. And we still manufacture a lot, but not all of it. Uh, so I went to Jim Millis, who was the president of one of the companies, and I told him I wanted to get a whole bunch of socks. And he asked me what kind. I said, I want just the socks I have on. They all came from the same place, you know. And I told him I wanted some of these type of socks, black, mainly black socks. And I want a whole bunch of them. So he said, well, Robert, you know, what you going to do? You're not going to sell them in the store or nothing. I said, no, I'm going to give them away. So he gave me a special deal. I'd get he just loaded my car up with just full, I mean, car and date mag, everything up full of socks with dozens of them in each box. And I would send them out to all the guys, like John Lewis. John, every time I see John Lewis, and every time you see John now, uh, just pull up, tell him, I told you, pull up your, <laughs> pull up your pants leg, pull up your pants leg and see what he said. <laughs> He said, oh, that's Bob Brown. <laughs> so there was a, we want to speak directly to the conference. There was a private session today. So at one point, you're on the board of that field, and you have these, and you have your clients. That's right. So you're all running the game. <laughs> that's what they everybody thought, yeah. In some ways, right? Oh, yeah. Because no. the operation Redbass was your zone, right? So that's right. So you threatened the boycott. Oh, yeah. And I, I think it's extremely important. And I'll just give you one instant that, that, uh, that something can happen. And um, this is in the Smithsonian, uh, a recording of it. Dr. King made a speech in, uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, he was trying to get seal test dairies, and he was starting in Ohio because they had a big operation there. He was trying to get seal tests uh, to integrate uh, their workforce. I mean, they didn't have, they didn't even have a black truck driver, you know, to, to deliver, you know how they used to deliver milk? I mean, they had no black. I'm talking about in Cleveland and places like that. No black delivering milk. They didn't hire no blacks to do anything. So Dr. King said, you know, I got to take off of them. And he went and tried to meet with them. They wouldn't meet with him and none of that. So Dr. King called me. He said, Bob, I'm up here in Cleveland. I don't know what to do. He was telling me what had, what had happened. He said, and, you know, we can't afford to do this. He said, we don't have no money, so we can't press too hard because people get in jail and we can't get them out and all this. I said, well, Martin, just hold on. Give me, give me another day or two to deal with this thing and let me think of something. So I hung up the phone. And I said, let me go call, let me uh, call uh, A&P stores, which was one of my clients. A&P was the biggest supermarket chain in America. And I called the chairman of the board's office, and the secretary answered, and I told him, I, her, I said, look, I got to see the chairman right away. Is he in town? She said, yeah, Bob, he's here. And I said, just break out of time. Tell him I'm on my way to New York. Break out of time when I can see him. So I went. Uh, to the airport, jumped on a plane, went to New York, 
went right in, and he got me in his office, and I told him, I said, look, we're going to be in real trouble if we don't get this thing fixed here with Dr. King in Ohio. And uh, because seal test dairy is the one who they're dealing with, but where does seal test have to go to sell its milk? A and P. They got more stores than anybody. So I said, it's going to be, the onus is going to be on us, and psychologically and business-wise, it doesn't make any sense for us to take some beating for something that somebody else ain't doing right. He's, he stopped there and scratched his head a couple minutes. He said, Bob, you know you damn right. He called, he called, he punched the button, told the secretary to get the executive vice president in there because he wants to see him right away. The guy came in, and he said, uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. He said, Bob, tell him what you told me. So I repeated the story, and I told him what I thought we need to do. And the chairman didn't get a guy to time to speak. He said, I think Bob is right. He said, I want you to call those GD, seal test people, get the chairman of the board on the phone, and tell him that, uh, we are going to take action if they don't get this thing settled with Dr. King. And he said, tell him I had recommended, this is what I recommend, I recommended that, that they call him and tell him that they're going to take all of the uh, seal test products out of all the stores in Cleveland. And I thought that would be more than enough to give him a message. And so he told him, he says, I want you to call that GD chairman and tell him to take, that we're going to take all the seal test products out of all A&P stores in the whole state of Ohio. Said, you tell him that. Shoot. I said, okay. I said, oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> here, here I go again. I'm stirring up Trump. So I get on out of there. I tell him, I said, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've been great. So I go back to the airport. I go back to North I'm so I get to the airport, and you know, we didn't have no cell phones back then. So I go to one of them wall phones and call my office, and they tell me that, uh, Mr. Brown, that Dr. King is desperately trying to get a hold of you. So I called Martin. He was still in Cleveland. I called Martin, and Martin said, he just hollered over the phone, Bob, what in the world did you tell them people up there at a &P? He said, the chairman of the board, of seal test trying to reach me. So he done called me about five times in the last hour. And I did I wasn't gonna talk to him until I talked to you to find out what you told him people. Because we couldn't even get in touch to that man. So I told him what I told him and what the what the AP was gonna do if they didn't and Mark said, Lord have mercy. He said, Lord have mercy. So he just kept saying, Lord have mercy. I said, look <laughs> I said, I said, I'm going to go on back home, and I'll talk to you guys later on. I said, but the deck is clear. I said, you can go in there and get anything you want to. They went in there and got the job, got the stuff for black organizations, everything he wanted, they got. Now, here's a, kick, here's a kicker. That night, later that night, or the next time, maybe in the next night, they call a mass rally at the largest black church in Cleveland, which was uh, Reverend Odie Hoover's church, Carol Hoover's father. And, and the, they, got it, they, they, they got it all on tape. It's over at the Smithsonian, if y'all want to hear it. At Martin's speech that night, he made it. People standing, a thousand people on the outside. They couldn't even, because word had gone around that Martin had broken the seal test thing. And so Martin, made this speech, and in his speech, he talked about, did you hear the speech, you heard it. He, he talked about, he said, uh, we've been having all this big problem with seal tests, they wouldn't talk to us, we couldn't, they would hang up the phone, wouldn't do nothing. He said, but they didn't know that we had Bob Brown. Bob Brown was on our board. And then he said, Bob went up there, and he told them, and he said, uh, A&P was going to take all the business away from uh, 
field test. He said, then they came on and jumped on in. He said, they've been calling so hard, we couldn't do nothing for them. We couldn't turn around for them. And so that was the measure. Those were the kinds of things that we did, ultimately, not only with seal tests, but other mega companies in America who had never done anything in the black community and didn't plan to do nothing. I mean, all we wanted to do was hire a few milk truck drivers and maybe a couple of secretaries in the office or something like that. Or some, I mean, we didn't even ask for that much. But they didn't want to do anything. And so I was working with Martin and, and Jim Farmer and all the rest of them to help change that. Because I said, if it's ever going to be changed, we got to work it. But we have to work it on the same basis that many times they work everything. You know, and what, what I mean is that, you know, we'll go in and we'll throw box rocks and bottles and maybe set the place on fire and everything. And then when the place burned down, they'll build another one, but you still are not in there. You can't get a job. So it don't make no difference whether you burn down or not. But what, 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 what I was trying to stress and what I did stress so many times in the councils of of Core and Snick and with John and Martin and all of them, is that let's go in with some power. Don't go in there talking about what you're going to do. You ain't going to do nothing because they're going to get the police and the army and everybody else and just shoot you down and bury, put, dig a ditch and put, throw you in it. So what we have to do is, and that's the same thing I'm saying we have to do now. And we have the power to do it. It's nothing that we think we can get. We th we've already done it. I mean, we did it when you couldn't, wouldn't supposed to do it. Now we're walking around here free as a bird, got everything going for us, and won't do nothing. Won't get nothing working. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm fed up with it myself. I'm, it's, it's, it's crazy out here. Because I see so many of us who don't have jobs, uh, who can't get, you'd say, well, that company, they don't seem to want to hire blacks too much, or they don't have that many. Uh, and, then, and then those same companies many times are going through the black community selling everything. Many of them, 50% uh, or more of their business is coming from the black community, and they don't even have a black on the board of directors or black in, uh, in, uh, in the hierarchy of the company. What you talking about? I mean, they're not crazy. We're crazy if we let that go by. You know, we can't afford to let that go by. And this is not being antagonistic. This just be talk. It's called fair. That's what my grandmother called it. She said, Bobby, everybody ought to work at things to be fair. And, uh, you know, that's the way we have to go get it, though. You ain't gonna go get it and going down there burning up the men, building or killing people. Hey, don't even have to do that. It's not necessary. We've already shown that you don't have to do that. You know, so we had to go in another direction. So if you want to hear more of these stories, I would urge you to, to, to get your autobiography, You can't go wrong. Do it right with Grandma's brown spring. But what is the role? It plays a huge role in not only in our lives, but the lives of our children and and children yet unborn. I mean, we we don't seem to think about that enough. Uh, my my grandmother used to think about that and talk about that all the time. She had a, a third grade education, and she would talk to me about, you know, we got to look after those children that are coming along. That 
you know, people don't seem to think about that anymore. I mean, just uh, we, we have to regroup because we can do anything that we want to do. It's legitimate and above board. All we have to do is do it together. We have to, if we want, if we want Ebony, if we want the Ebony's and the Jets and the Cleveland Call and Post and the Afro and the Washington Informer and all these papers to survive, certainly they should survive. We need to be supportive. We need to say, and, and we need to say to companies, our organizations, I'm talking about our sororities and fraternities and everything else, our churches can call up companies and tell them, why aren't you advertising in the Cleveland Call and Polls? Why aren't you advertising in Ebony or Jet or whatever and whatever? Our, com our churches, our organizations, the Alphas, the Omegas, and all the rest of them. We ain't doing nothing. And I am so sick of it, I don't know what to do. All our people have died, and, and uh, Martin and, and, and all of them, everybody, those, all those guys, Jim Farmer and all of them and I work closely with, have put their lives on the line. They, they gambled everything to make sure that we had a way and we won't even go to a meeting. We won't even get nothing together. Our organizations, if my life depended on it right now, I couldn't name you who the national president of the NAACP is. If my life depended on it. I just, I'm just, I, I, there's something wrong with what's going on in our society as it relates to black folk. You know, and I don't care who hears me say this. I, you know, the churches, for instance, the churches, when have you seen of all the things that's happening in the black community now on a national basis, how many churches, the heads of those churches, do you know have written a letter to anybody, the companies or to the government or anybody else about those problems that we're facing, that our children are facing, that our communities, how many churches do you know? No, you know, I mean, how many churches, many of them have, you got to give many of them some credit. They have feeding programs and so forth, uh, and that's wonderful. But there are many, many that we have already proven what the church can do. We proved it during the Civil Rights Movement, because if it had not been for the churches, and I'm talking about the National Baptist Convention, the, the, the United Methodist Church, I'm talking about the AME Zion Church, the AME Church, the Church of God in Christ, all of them. If they form, we have already, we already know that if they come together, not all of them, if just a few of those denominations come together and ask the president or the companies or anybody else for anything, and they're going to get it because they can't afford that kind of fight in America. Nobody can afford that. But we won't even ask. Ain't nobody even asking. Our people are suffering left, right, and sideways, and we won't even ask. Well, our organization won't even open their mouth. How many letters did the AKAs and the Deltas and the Alphas and all, how many letters have they written about many of the problems we face Who, to different groups and people in the government and in businesses? If we had a big meeting and got just, not all of them, just a number of them together, do you know we could change this country around? We could turn this country upside down and sideways? Well, I know there's a lot more we could talk about. I think we have to, we have to shut it down. So, do you want to do one last, because you're a positive person, since you've done so much to make all of us just giving us that hard critique, but you got to put some wind beneath our wings. Well, what can you tell us? Well, I can tell you what has helped me. I, I have worked all over the world uh, for many governments. I've put governments together. I admit I've torn two or three apart, too. But I've put them together, and I've worked in government here in America in the highest levels, and 
I worked with the largest companies in the world. I served on the largest boards of the companies in the world. Uh, but what, what we should be doing is we should be coming together. And all of us have an opportunity to spark something in your arena, wherever you are. Your local church, your local social organization, your local fraternity. I'm not talking about you don't have to go to the national meeting to start nothing. All the stuff that we started, it was started in towns. You know, the Birmingham movement. We didn't come to Washington to start no Birmingham movement. You know, uh, it was all in Alabama, in Birmingham. So wherever you are, there's a spark that you can light and you can lift up. Our people need to be lifted up. You see what's happening in many of our communities around the country. I mean, just, I mean, it was, it's sometimes I just, I'm on an airplane or something. I start thinking about where we have come from, where we are now, and tears just start rolling down my eyes because many of our institutions are closing up. You know, you, these black papers and, and uh, other entities like that, they're shutting down. You know why they're shutting down? First of all, because you all are not reading it. We are not reading them as like they ought to. The second thing, and most importantly, is they can't get two cents worth of advertising from companies that you are spending billions of dollars with. Billions. And they can't get two cents worth of advertising from them. And that's, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with us if we keep going down that road. You know, but our children and our children's children will suffer. You know, some of us will be away from here, you know, but they're going to suffer. And we don't need to leave that kind of legacy behind us. So all of us need to get together. And it doesn't take much, just a little bit. Here and there, you know, just, you don't have to tell, have no national movement. People are always talking about you got to have a national movement. Just do it right where you are. Be the sport. 